back. We're talking with Rob Dameron, the head coach at Macomb, Dakota. Rob has been honored for 2023 as the Michigan High School Coaches Association Coach of the Year. And that's the o- umbrella organization for the Michi- all of Michigan sports for the Michigan High School Athletic Association. And we are part of the Michigan High School Lacrosse Coaches Association, which you were nominated from. And this is the first time we've done this award, and we're kind of starting with you as the first, as, as an honoree, as part of our Hall of Fame rollout, which comes here uh, this week. And Rob, first of all, I think it's a terrific honor that you that you received from this organization, and uh, congratulations. And I just, we wanted to talk to you a little bit about it, because uh, you obviously had a great 2023. Well, well, thank you, Greg. Thanks for having me on. I, I really appreciate it, and I can't wait to, to delve into the conversation. Uh, it, it is a great honor. It was certainly unexpected. Uh, we had the banquet last Sunday. Uh, it was it was really enjoyable. Um, and let's get into it. Well, let me just give a brief description. The Michigan High School Coaches Association is an organization that is sort of an umbrella organization over the 28 sports played in Michigan. So there's baseball and football and basketball and, and lacrosse and all the various sports. All those organizations are represented by an association like ours, Coaches Lacrosse Coaches Association. They then have the opportunity to uh, nominate their own coach of the year. And the cool part of this is, is that the coaches are nominated by the previous winners from that list. And this our list goes back probably 25 years for that award. And the second part is you can only win it once. So this is really an achievement. So it's not something you can win multiple times. And it's a pretty terrific honor. So it's voted, it's nominated by the guys on the list and then voted by the guys who, who were previous winners, which I think is a, a real small world of being able to have that kind of honor because Obviously, you know, it's 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 not just everybody uh, and his brother being able to vote for the for the process. So I'm sure part of it is is history, but certainly part of it is that you've uh, done an unbelievable job at Dakota. And maybe just talk a little bit about your team. And then I want to take you back a little bit with LaSalle, with DeLaSalle and just sort of a little bit of East Side Lacrosse. OK, uh, yeah, I, we, we had a pretty good season last year, uh, you know, with with the changing. I mean, we're a very young program. I mean, we we founded uh founded Dakota in 2017, uh, along with uh, my co-head coach, Mike Benavides. And he's been an integral part of, of growing, growing the sport uh, and continue to grow it on the east side. Um, in 2017, actually 2018 was the last year that we had the Macomb Bucks, the east side lacrosse youth program. So then we started thinking, what are we going to do? Where are we going to get these kids? So we've been operating uh, pretty much. We, we got with Coach Benoit. Uh, he moved his whole program, the Knights, uh, right into our backyard. And those teams, a lot of kids are going to De La Salle. A lot of kids are going to Lance Cruz North, Eisenhower, Romeo, and we might get three or four. Uh, so it's certainly not like a machine we see on the West side and in certain schools. So we really have to work, I think, that much harder. Uh, we get kids coming in, and I think this is a great thing. I had uh, three kids playing in college right now that started as juniors, start picked up a stick for the first time as juniors. And I think it's a great uh, testament to our program that we have seniors coming out for the first time. They just say, I don't care if I play or not. I just want to be part of this atmosphere. I want to be a part of this program. And, and, and we let them. Uh, if they're a good quality kid and they're good for the program and they just want to grow and develop themselves, not necessarily as an athlete, but as a person. So, it, yeah, it, it's exciting. And, and, this up, and last year we had a, good, a pretty good year. We ended up uh, losing to Brother Rice in the, in the regional semifinals. But I told the boys, I said, guys, we made it almost the entire game before it got to that 18 goal mark. There was like a minute and a half left in the game. Uh, And and we played really well. Um, AJ actually called a timeout, like the first three minutes, he called the timeout because we already had like three shots on goal. And, and I don't think they were really expecting that. Um, and, and that could happen. I mean, here you got this team playing, you know, this high school uh, from the east side. That's a newer program. And I think we we kind of, you know, came out a little stronger than they thought. So uh, that's that's we're not going to surprise anybody, I think, anymore. Lacrosse is getting better on the east side. The pockets around the state. I know Lansing's had a, a really good comeback here recently. The, if you look at some of those mid, mid-Michigan teams um, up north, you get Traverse Cities and Toskies, they're getting better. We are moving forward. We do have more teams playing. Unfortunately, we have less kids playing lacrosse in the state of Michigan at the moment. A lot of that contributed to uh, the pandemic. We have 179 teams. We've lost almost 800 athletes overall in the last couple of years, but at least those areas seem to be getting and finding a a way back up. And certainly the east side is no different from that. So you guys have done a good job of 
a producing talent over there. And I think that's a, a tribute to coaches like yourself. Well, I appreciate that. It, it is, it is uh, trying to keep the, the youth programs. Uh, a lot of the coaches that were with me early on, uh, they actually did a spinoff and formed the N53 Bulldogs. So Romeo, because uh, we kind of absorbed Romeo's, uh, or well, it was Eisenhower, basically Eisenhower Romeo feeder program. Uh, we absorbed them because their coach left. So they were with us for about four or five years. And then it, it became a drive for those, those parents. And so some of my younger uh, coaches, well, not younger in age, but younger experienced coaches uh, who were coaching youth for me decided to form M53 Bulldogs. So that's really taken off over there too. So it's kind of neat to see how, all these things uh, have developed over the years. And, and, you know, one of my claim claims of fame is, and I always like to tease them is, is uh, Chris Colin at UD mercy. He was my assistant coach for, for two years in summer travel for 1763. So I say, yeah, you're, you were my assistant. Now you're a D one coach. So it's kind of funny to, to look at, at, at that. And we're actually playing another one of my former players from De La Salle. He's just, he just called me up a couple weeks ago. He's super excited to get the head coach at Farmington Hills. So we scheduled him immediately and got a game with him. That's uh, James Brunk. Um, so it, it, that's it's really kind of neat how we just you see kids they come in, you just bounce them around the state and, and keep developing, keep trying to get more kids interested. You know, you don't have to necessarily be a great player to be a great coach, but you're one of both. You had the opportunity to be an All American at Deal South, kind of started that first wave. You were at Michigan State when it was, it was a varsity program under Rich Kim Kimball. And some of those programs, unfortunately, as we all know, that that you know program was sort of let go financially for a number of reasons. But you had a, an unbelievable and a stellar career. And uh, do you see any translation from what you played and the way you coach? Is there any similarities? Uh, I, I think the game, the I think with the advancement of the equipment, number one. So you can look at equipment as. You know, I, I have back on, uh, you can't see it, but on the wall over there, I have my old bucket helmet and, and, and the, the old leather gloves. And I remember we used to play with no palms. And then Coach Kimball had some lady he found and she saw, sewed in some like lamb intestines or something for a palm. It was horrible to even hang on to the stick. Um, so the equipment certainly has changed, but the kid has changed. Uh, so the way we used to coach, I mean, back, back in the, in the 80s and early 90s, it, it was a much more physical game. And then it started changing into more of a finesse game. And the athletes we get, uh, the work ethic, uh, there was a kind of a lull there in, in really pushing kids and trying to get them to, to put in the extra effort and understanding what hard work was. So your mentality, you could still push, but you're going to lose more and more kids. And I think the, the, the great thing about our program is we continue to push and not lower the hurdle and so they could crawl underneath it. We just kept it high and said, this is what you got to do to be a part of this program. So, yeah, I think certainly the kids have changed. The equipment has changed. But I think my mentality as a player, uh, and now 31 years later, I, I'm still coaching the same way that I played. And it was successful for me, and, and the program speaks for itself. So I think I think a lot of coaches, when they change their mentality to meet the kid, now you're doing them a disservice. It's just like in the classroom. You know, the kids are different, you know, 30 years I've been teaching and the kids are different. And if you lower it just to meet the kids demands and needs with new technologies and all this, uh, I, I think you're, you're, you're doing a disservice to the kid. Rob, you're an English teacher, so there's nothing more structured in, in terms of education than the structure of language, the way we speak, the way we talk. That's certainly been fractured the last 15 years because of just slang and the rest of it goes with it. So you have to be a real studious teacher to be able to understand the structure. Does that translate to any, any part of your coach coaching philosophy? And, and my, and my question really is what do you think if you were explaining this to somebody who didn't know, what do you think it, it takes to be a good coach today? Well, I, I really think your support system, uh, you know, one of the first things out of my mouth at the banquet uh, for the coach of the year award last Sunday was, you know, thanks to God, thanks to my wife um, for her support. Um, without her support and and then my my, my parents the, the parent program ha having the the parents in your program being giving you support uh, on all the stuff that you can't get to as a coach because I think the the mentality you, you back in the day I think a coach could just show up 
take out his whistle. He's coaching the game. Kids were there. Kids are going. Now it's more, it's, it's, it has to be more structured. I mean, we have different kids. So I think the mentality is uh, certainly changing the aspect that you have to kind of lay everything out for the kids. You know, we have to say, tell the kids all the time, check your email. Why do you check your email every day? Because that's what grownups do. That's what adults do. That's what young men do. And it's crazy when a kid will say, well, I, it's not on my Insta snap or, or whatever the heck different service they use. I'm like, check your email, like a, like a grown man. And uh, so that mentality has changed. And certainly in the classroom, I mean, I, I I'm an English teacher, but I, I think I teach good American. And then I, I try to get them into English right. a little bit, but I think uh, really understanding more uh, about a kid's background. I'm in a low income school. And understanding a lot and having conversations with kids is something that I didn't have to do back at Deal Sal or Gross Point North. And I didn't have to have those kind. I didn't know that about the, the, the kids. Now, my athletes, I know them as individuals. I think it's important. Um, I, I kind of wish I could go back in time. And but back then it was more rigid, but the ex, but the expectations were there and the kids rose and met those expectations. Now you have to understand why is this kid acting this way and have an understanding. So I think coaching has taken on more of a, just blowing a whistle, I think to more being a, a big brother, a father figure, uh, a mentor, someone to lean on. Not that previous coaches weren't, but I think the role has certainly been redefined and broadened. I always think of guys who retire and they put a microphone in their front of their face and they, you know, what are you going to miss? They never talk about missing two hour practices in the heat. They never talk about, they talk about the camaraderie in the locker room and the bus rides and all the things that, that go with that process. And I think that's the, I don't think that we've lost that. I think the friendship and the, and the, and the fellowship that you develop, which is really a coach's responsibility at the end of, yes. at the, end of the day, kid calls me and says, you know, mom calls me and says, coach, what time is practice today? And I said, I have no idea. I said, you can check the website or you can have your son call me. He needs to call me, not you. And that's great. That's um, ma'am, I'm not trying to be a pain in the butt. I'm just simply not going to answer the question because his responsibility is to figure out if there's a catastrophic problem, please call me. If you have a, a question, please call me. But I'm not talking to you about routine stuff because you're not the secretary. So I, I, I appreciate that answer. Last question. Somebody calls up and says you're the Michigan High School Coach of the Year for lacrosse for the Michigan High School Coaches Association. It's got to make you feel pretty good. It did. It came out of left field. I was, it was completely unexpected. Um, and I didn't even really understand what it entailed until all the literature started coming in and the filling out the background information. And then one, I think once you start putting it on paper, when you start looking, uh, I mean, Coach Jolly hired me at De La Salle in 1994 and uh, we won the state championship. So I thought coaching was super easy. I'm like, well, this is easy. <laughs> well, I've never been back to a state title game. Uh, in all these years, but we've come close. It, it's not an easy thing. And uh, I started to have a more, much greater, deeper appreciation for the body of work. Once you start putting it on paper and you start looking at the accomplishments. And I think it's, it's not a, a bragging thing. It's not an, an honor thing. I think it's something to remind coaches to start, Hey, go back and look at your previous records, you know, go back and look at the different types of teams that you had and, and what was the makeup and what was the dynamics and what was positive and what do you want to recreate uh, with this next group? What do you get away from that you used to do that was successful and you kind of get away from it as, as years go past. So I think that uh, that made me really that reflection piece, I think of winning it was really something special winning the award. Great, fantastic. And being honored with, all those other coaches across the, the state of Michigan was really special. It certainly wasn't expected, but I, I really appreciated the fact that I had to fill out so much paperwork to give them like a biography uh, that it really, I, I read it several times to, to say, Oh, and I started taking notes. <laughs> so it was kind of, kind of neat. Well, congratulations on being the Michigan high school coaches association lacrosse coach of the year and uh, have a great uh, 2024 spring. All right. Well, thank you for having me on. I appreciate the time.